Diplomacy, 1865 to 1915, The Making of a World Power. In January 1893, Hawaiian sugar planters launched a successful revolution against their queen, Lilio Kalani. They were backed by American marines who were stationed just off of the islands. America's involvement in Hawaii had been growing steadily since their initial forays as early as the 1820s. By the mid-19th century, the United States depended heavily upon the sugar trade with Hawaii, and Hawaii's economy became almost exclusively tied to sugar. This relationship grew mutually dependent increasingly until the 1890s, when Congress approved a heavy tariff which crippled the Hawaiian economy and uh, strengthened America's position in relation to Hawaii. Hawaiian planters understood that if they were to be annexed by the United States, in other words, if they were to become a part of the United States, they would no longer have to pay the tariff and their economy would be restored. This was at the root of the uprising in January of 1893. For several years, debate raged in the United States what the status of Hawaii should be. The president, Grover Cleveland, supported restoring the crown to Queen Liliuokalani and allowing Hawaii to maintain its independence. But the momentum was already building towards imperialism and taking colonies. Many Americans observed other nations, uh, such as England, France, Germany, and others, taking colonies in Africa and Asia and other parts of the world and felt the United States was being left behind as the greater powers around the world grew. By 1898, with the outbreak of the Spanish-American War, the annexation of Hawaii grew inevitable. It was President William McKinley who ultimately made the decision to annex the islands, which proved to be an invaluable way station and naval station uh, between the United States and the Philippines and the rest of Asia. The annexation of Hawaii marks a turning point in American diplomatic history. Prior to this event, the United States was a marginal world power, and I'll share a few statistics in just a moment, but few nations around the world looked with much respect upon the United States. After the annexation of Hawaii, the United States is now beginning to climb the ladder, so to speak, among the international powers. They are an imperial nation. They are taking colonies, and as we will see, the momentum uh, only increases throughout the rest of the 1890s. And so this chapter is, in essence, a study of the creation of what would become the world's only superpower, uh, the transition from a marginal world power at best to the most powerful nation in the world. It may be difficult for us to imagine today a time when the United States was not a significant world power. But that was, in fact, exactly the case prior to the 1890s. The United States in the years following the Civil War didn't crack the top ten in the world powers as far as the strength of their army and navy. If we look at some of the statistics on the screen... In 1890, the United States Army ranked only as the 13th largest in the world, only about 28,000 troops. Notice that by 1900, and this following the Spanish-American War, which we will discuss shortly, the Army had grown to 100,000 or more. In 1884, the United States Navy was only the 12th largest in the world, and many of the ships that they had were Civil War vintage or older, run-down, shoddy, pock-filled, and inferior. The general diplomatic policy or plan of the United States prior to 1890 also bears little resemblance to what we would see in the 20th century. It hinged upon a handful of policies that uh, only loosely connected with each other.
Among the cornerstones of American policy was the idea of isolation. The United States divided from the rest of the world by two huge oceans, which in that era were a far more formidable barrier than they are even today. It took a tremendous amount of effort for anyone from Europe to reach the United States or anyone from Asia to reach the United States. And so it was thought our best policy was simply to remain isolated and not engage with the rest of the world. In a similar vein, United States policy depended largely on what had come to be known as the Monroe Doctrine, issued by President James Monroe back in the 1820s. And the idea of the Monroe Doctrine uh, supported this thought of isolation. It was essentially a message to Europe to Stay out of the affairs in the Americas. This is our hemisphere. We will oversee uh, relations in this part of the world, and we will not interfere in Europe. You can oversee uh, matters over there. A final thought, and one that was increasing in prominence uh, approaching the end of the 19th century was known as the open door. This was an idea that had been uh, circulating for decades and it related to Asia and specifically China and the argument was that there should be an open door to China for all foreign nations. That is, we're not going to carve up China in the way that had been done in Africa and South America and other parts of the world where distinct European nations claimed as their own chunks of territory in these other places. In China and Asia, let us uh, preserve an open door. Let each nation have equal access. And obviously this was a policy to our advantage as a nation that was not actively engaged in the rest of the world. Uh, in a sense, this was our only hope of maintaining access to China because we were not interested in seizing power for ourselves. Finally, we might say that the diplomatic core uh, for the United States prior to the 1890s showed a distinct lack of professionalism. Diplomatic posts were frequently viewed as uh, plums of appointment. Uh, the president or other officials in charge of making these appointments would select a family friend, someone they had worked with, a family member, uh, and appoint them to these posts around the world where they uh, were stationed in some exotic location, and there were all kinds of opportunities for uh, making money in these foreign countries. On the whole, our diplomats frequently didn't speak the language of the country that they were stationed to. They had no training in the history and culture of the nations. Uh, more embarrassingly still, oftentimes these officials um, were steeped in racism and uh, lack of understanding and treated the people of the foreign countries as inferiors to be kicked around. And so there are any number of embarrassing incidents in which American diplomats, these are representatives of the United States, um, careen through the streets firing guns into the air, or uh, give drunken uh, racist speeches, or uh, even worse, uh, rape uh, the women in their country or commit crimes, uh, and all of these sorts of things. So all of these policies are going to evolve in the 1890s, and certainly this idea of professionalism and training um, in the diplomatic corps will become a much higher priority uh, in the 1890s and beyond. The 1890s were a tumultuous decade in which the United States diplomacy was forced to change uh, in what was indeed a rapidly changing and evolving world. We've already seen on the home front a number of these developments and changes uh, that led many people to begin uh, changing their thinking about America's role in the world. First of all, on the home front, the 1890s were largely a decade characterized by malaise and anxiety. Uh, that is, the, the country sank into something of a depression uh, in this decade. 
And the reasons for it are many of the things we've discussed over the last chapter or two. Uh, Many Americans were becoming concerned and indeed obsessed with what we might describe as the decline of American stock. The incredible influx of immigrants into the country led those of the sort of traditional white European background to become concerned that that uh, American stock, so to speak, was um, being smeared by all of the immigrants coming into the country. There's a a sort of racist um, belief underpinning this thought. We've talked in previous chapters about the rise of the cities, the rise of big business, uh, labor clashes, and all of these sorts of things. And while there are certainly some things to be celebrated about those developments, as we discussed previously, there were also many um, negatives and many reasons for concern. We've talked about uh, crime and pollution and uh, the, the idea of social Darwinism, the incredible difficult working conditions of that era. And so again, many uh, people in the country were suffering during this period. And so the 1890s are something of a a decade of chaos. Uh, Again, we talked about uh, some of the clashes like Homestead and Pullman and uh, different things going on on the home front. There were lots of um, sort of unpredictable and difficult and challenging events. Contributing to this was an argument presented in 1893 by a young historian named Frederick Jackson Turner. Now, we as historians generally don't aspire to fame, and very few of us ever become uh, household names, so to speak. But uh, Frederick Jackson Turner is certainly one of those historians who has uh, achieved a a level of celebrity, certainly a well-known figure. And in the 1890s and early 20th century, he would probably have been a household name. In fact, almost everyone knew what Turner uh, was writing about. And his argument in 1893 has come to be known as the Frontier Thesis. The Frontier Thesis. And and Turner um, was using as his source the census of 1890. So he was looking back on this information from a couple of years earlier. And what he determined uh, from looking at that census was that the American frontier was now closed. And to you and me in the modern setting, that might not sound like a a hugely novel idea or even something all that important. But in the 1890s, uh, this really struck a tremendous amount of concern and even fear into the hearts of many Americans. Because what Turner was describing was a nation, the United States, that had always had a frontier out to the west, that is, an expanse of open land into which people could move and into which the nation itself could grow and expand. Now, Turner is postulating that frontier is closed. There isn't any wide open space anymore out in the west in this country. He looked at the census and determined that, in fact, the west was, uh, had become filled up and there wasn't anywhere else for this country to go. Now, the fears based on this thesis ranged wildly. There were people predicting uh, economic chaos, a collapse of the economy, all these sorts of things that never really came to fruition. But another thought that raised concern was simply, where are people going to go? Now that the frontier has filled up, we've always had this sort of outlet to the West. And this contributes to a thought, uh, a growing thought of many that, in fact, we need to keep on looking further to the west. We need to look out across the Pacific um, and even to Asia and perhaps beyond. And we'll get to some of those thoughts a little bit later. Contributing further to this atmosphere of malaise and anxiety was a a severe depression that struck the nation in 1893. And again, I mentioned this in a previous lecture when we talked about the Pullman strike, which was tied to this same economic depression. Uh, The country struggled with this over the the next several years and kind of sank again in 1897. Um, So at any time this sort of economic struggle sets in, Um, everything becomes more uh, 
uh, tense for the country. And some of you may uh, recall similar experiences in our own recent history over the last six or seven or eight years. Uh, things thankfully have improved for the time being, but it wasn't that long ago that uh, 12 to 15 percent of the country was unemployed and people were wondering where their next paycheck was coming from and they were looking at their retirement funds uh, sort of being vaporized. And you may remember some of the anxiety that that sort of thing creates. Another development of this period was that Americans were observing as other European powers, other powers around the world, began sort of staking their claim to unclaimed territory around the world. Uh, Africa was carved up by the European nations in the 1880s. By the 1890s, uh, European nations are beginning to claim parts of territory in Asia and China. And I talked briefly about the open door on a previous slide. And so there's a growing sense that the United States needs to get moving on these things. The United States needs to engage in this sort of process or we will be left behind as the rest of the world moves forward. All of these things uh, come to a head in the episode I described in the uh, first slide, uh, the annexation of Hawaii in 1893, the United States beginning to break out of what I described on the last slide as this old diplomacy, isolation, lack of professionalism, lack of engagement with the world, and now they are beginning to forge ahead towards a new diplomacy, and the events in Hawaii form sort of a bridge between that old way of doing things and this new way of doing things in the 1890s. There are other factors changing in the 1890s as well. Uh, the United States is simply growing as a nation. We are becoming among the most populated countries in the world. Uh, certainly a city like New York City is becoming uh, one of the, uh, the centers of global commerce and um, technology and all kinds of innovation. And so it becomes harder and harder to remain isolated and uninvolved with the rest of the world. There's a sense of curiosity from the rest of the world, if nothing else. You know, what is going on in this rising nation, the United States? I mentioned technology is coming along during this period. Electricity the telephone, uh, telegraph lines. Communication is becoming much more rapid, even immediate during this time. And so where once uh, it took months to get word back and forth between Europe and the United States, now messages can be sent instantly. And again, it, it's uh, becoming more and more difficult for the United States to simply stay out of things. In military terms, the pace of conflict uh, has risen dramatically. More and more nations maintaining standing armies. Uh, transportation is improving. The railroads have made things much easier to get around. Uh, while we're not there yet, we're, we're not too far off from things like the automobile and the airplane. And so where uh, once wars took years and years to evolve and things played out very slowly. In this era, wars um, took place over simply a matter of weeks or months. And as we will see, that pace only quickens. And so there's more and more pressure to be ready and to have a standing army and to have uh, a, a capable navy and these sorts of things at the ready. These ideas are further promoted by a new generation in American leadership. The old Civil War generation that had done things their way, um, cavalry and horseback and cannons and these sorts of things, are, are now being replaced by a new, younger generation that is much more in tune with the developments of their day. And uh, we certainly see these things play out in our own society um, nowadays, and in particular with technology. I'm sure you all know, you know, sort of th those of your grandparents' generation who, um, believe it or not, didn't grow up with computers or cell phones or any of these things at their disposal, and so they're perhaps slow to grab uh, the opportunities that might be presented. By contrast, 
the younger generation, those of your generation, uh, have grown up with computers in the home and with cell phones and all of these technologies in hand, and so you're much more ready and quick to adapt. And similar things were happening in the 1890s. There's also a growing sense of patriotism. I mentioned on the previous slide these concerns about American stock. Well, this leads many people to become sort of hyper-patriotic, uh, proud, flag-waving Americans. And this kind of thought begins to penetrate uh, America's diplomacy. There comes to be a sense that we should literally be the flag bearers and the standard bearers um, carrying the stars and stripes and all of its greatness uh, abroad. I think we can carry this over into the growing uh, acceptance of imperialist thought. The idea that the United States should, in fact, become an imperial power, should um, take colonies, should lead the way uh, into other parts of the world. Among the figures promoting this idea is the man pictured here, whose name was Alfred Thayer Mahan. And Mahan was another very prominent name at that time. He had written what would become a very famous book uh, about the prominence of the Navy in world history. And his argument was essentially that uh, a gr every great nation has a great and powerful Navy. And the United States uh, needed to improve its Navy if it were to become a great nation. An extension of that thought, according to Mahan, is that if we are going to have this great Navy, we need to have naval bases and naval stations around the world. And so we need to look uh, across the Pacific to obtain uh, islands and nations that could become um, naval bases. And we think of Hawaii uh, springing to mind, but places like the Philippines as well. And we need to look to the Caribbean uh, to obtain places where we might uh, station our navy. Uh, a, a different argument, but also supporting imperialism, was the idea of social Darwinism. And we might also phrase this in terms of the white man's burden, which we have talked about previously. The argument, again, that those of white European stock um, are the leaders of the world. They have the greatest intellect. They uh, have the right religion. They understand technology. They understand how uh, the world needs to move forward. And, in fact, it is uh, our duty representing that group to uplift the rest of the world and to help. And so we need to go to places like Hawaii and the Philippines and Asia and Latin America and bring with us all of our knowledge and the wonderful things that we can do. Now again, I've proposed to you a number of times already that this argument is rooted in racism. You know, who says that we do things the right way? Who says that these other nations aren't cultured and sophisticated and understand things. But, in fact, we were saying that in that era. And I think a corollary to this is uh, the idea of missionary zeal. Uh, that there are those at the forefront of kind of carrying the American flag abroad, um, but under the banner of Christianity and converting uh, the heathens in these far-flung nations around the world. So it's a similar thought to social Darwinism, but with its own flavor. So with all of these things moving us forward and urging us, uh, encouraging us to go to different places around the world and to spread our power and influence, by the 1890s, the United States, while not a great power yet, is on the brink and on the verge of becoming uh, a noteworthy world power. And so, by the 1890s, we might say that the old diplomacy has been pushed aside in favor of what one historian has described as the new diplomacy. There are lots of things at work here, but I'll just mention a couple of the highlights. Uh, one phrase that this historian used to describe this new diplomacy, uh, a beautiful phrase, is that system replaces spasm. Uh, 
prior to the 1890s, in terms of American diplomacy, things had just sort of happened randomly. The United States was always reacting to things, and, and any unpredictable event represented this, just this sort of spasm that uh, the country had to respond um, because we weren't really prepared for anything in particular. By the 1890s, uh, there is becoming a system in place. Um, we are prepared for things. And in fact, the episode in Hawaii in 1893 represents that. The American military was there. We were prepared. In fact, we had sort of been planning for uh, an event like this in Hawaii. And when the moment arose, we were prepared and ready to seize it. Related to this is the uh, the grooming and creation of a new diplomatic corps, um, diplomats who were trained uh, to be just that. They were not necessarily just appointments uh, of someone's um, friend or family member. Um, they are professionals. In fact, many of them have gone to school and have taken courses and learned languages and learned the history and culture of these nations. Uh, they are... Uh, instructed to behave professionally. They are representatives of our nation abroad, and so they can't be doing these wild, unpredictable, and in, at times awful things. Uh, they need to behave responsibly, professionally, represent uh, our nation well. And so by the late 1890s, the United States is, in fact, ready to forge ahead as a country of note uh, in terms of world powers.